thank you, Vanessa, and thank you for the worship team. You know, the song, Here in Your Presence, I, we come undone, and truly, we come undone in the presence of the awesome God, the Almighty God. We look at our sermon series, Awesome God, Normal People, and this awesome God is only by His grace that we normal human mortals can know Him, right? It's the awesome God, normal people. So today we continue with this series and we're on part three. And our sermon title for today is Yes and No. So before we begin, shall we all pray together the prayer for illumination? Together, Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture text for today is from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39. And let me read it to you. It says, See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver out of my hand. This verse comes from the Song of Moses that's recorded in Deuteronomy chapters 31 and 32. So Moses was nearing the end of his life, and God called him to write this song and to teach it to the Israelites. And in this verse, we see the God of yes and no. So when we pray, sometimes God says yes. He answers our prayer. It says here, I bring to life, I will heal. And sometimes he says, no, in this verse it says, I put to death, I have wounded. And sometimes it is a not yet. It seems like a no in the beginning, but after much prayer, it becomes a yes. So what does this verse tell us about God and our, our relationship with him? The first thing it tells us about God is that God is sovereign. It says here, see now that I myself am he, there is no God besides me. Two weeks ago, Sam Chu preached on the God who is both sovereign and personal. And I like his definition of the word sovereign. So with this agreement, I'm going to share that same definition with you. So here is Sam's definition. It says that when we say that God is sovereign, we refer to God's all-encompassing rule over the entire universe. We refer to his absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. And so because God is sovereign, he alone has the final say. All creation is subject to him. He rules the whole earth and all that is in it. So the second thing that we notice in this verse is that the life of every living creature is in God's hands. God says, I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. So whether we live or we die, whether we are healed or not, God has the ultimate say. Now sometimes by God's grace, we understand why he says yes and why he says no. But there are many times, especially when he says no, we don't understand why. And even sometimes when we understand why, we find it very difficult to go through that period and this is particularly so if it is a life and death issue or it is a health matter. But sometimes it could be some other matter, you know, you would know whether it's some matter in your family, your work, school, you know, many things in our lives. But whatever it is, whether we understand why God says yes or no, I think it is important for us to also consider how we ought to respond to God when he says yes and when he says no. And so this is what I'd like to look at this morning. So when God says yes, our first response is to thank him. And I think this is a very normal and natural response, right? That's usually the first thing we would do. You know, we pray, God says yes, he has granted us what we ask for, we thank him. But sometimes we may be very quick to say thank you, Lord. And after that, we move on to the next thing, more pressing matters we pray for, and whatever God has done gets pushed to the back of our minds. So let's be careful not to do that. And I sometimes wonder if we spend as much time thanking God and living out that gratitude as the amount of time that we spend praying for that one thing, 
I wonder how different things would be. So the next thing we ought to do is to tell, to tell of God's goodness. So when God has answered our prayers, we need to tell of His goodness. And when we do that, we give God the glory, we honour Him, we build somebody up, we encourage someone, we let somebody see the goodness of the Lord, and hopefully that person will also want a taste of that same goodness. And as we tell of His goodness, we remind ourselves that what we have is from God. It was He who gave it, and it wasn't us. And in the process, we are also encouraged, we are also built up. The third response is to remember. So in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses uh, talks to the Israelites to prepare them for their entry into Canaan. The Israelites had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. No permanent home, no permanent roof above their heads. But God was going to bring them in the promised land of Canaan where they could settle down, build their homes, plant their crops, raise their families. And so Moses warned them in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, when you have Settle in the promised land of Canaan when you have eaten and are satisfied. Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In verse 17 and 18, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So God knows the hearts of men, and He knows the inclination of the human heart. That's why He asked Moses to warn the Israelites that when they settled in Canaan, when they had plentiful food, fine houses, numerous livestock, and abundant wealth, they were liable to forget Him. They were liable to forget that it was God who had given them all those things. And when life became easy, they were liable to think that it was their own abilities that brought them to where they were. So Moses told the people, be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, that you do not fail to observe His commands and His laws. And doesn't this still ring true for us today? Sometimes when God says yes to us, particularly if it's something like a job, a promotion, we may start by really thanking God, right? We're truly thankful in our hearts. But after some time, with many people congratulating us and telling us how good we are, we might fall into the trap of thinking that, oh, actually, I was good to begin with, and this is my just and reasonable reward. And sure, you know God has given us um, certain strengths and gifts and abilities, and surely these ones would have enabled us, helped us to get to where we are, but we must never forget that all these came from God. And since they came from Him, He could easily take them away tomorrow. This weekend is Stewardship Weekend. So when I was preparing for the sermon and thinking on this point about remembering what God has given to us and that all that we have comes from Him, I was reminded of the parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 12. In that parable, Jesus talks about the rich man and he decided to build bigger barns so that he could store his increased harvest, and he thought he had it made. But God said to him, tonight your life will be demanded of you. This is a sobering par uh, parable for me. Every time I read this parable, I'm reminded that all that I have comes from God. Nothing on this earth lasts, you know, not our gifts or abilities, not our wealth or our possessions. So, since they all came from God, if God wants to take them away, He could take them away in an instant. And so I'm reminded always that whatever I have, whatever we have, we need to be good stewards. We need to render them unto the Lord the way He wants us to. So let us heed Moses' teaching to be careful not to forget the Lord our God, to obey Him, to walk with Him. 
for all that we have is from Him. And also we need to remember to be good stewards of all that He has given to us. So now let's look at the case when God says no. And this is always a hard one. And sometimes it can be devastating. It can bring us into a very dark valley, especially if it's a life and death matter or it is a health issue. I'd like to encourage us to consider three responses. These, of course, are not the only ones, and sometimes depending on the circumstances, you know, another response would be more appropriate, would be needful, but God has put it on my heart to share these three with you. Now, the first response is to remember, which was the last point I, I mentioned when God says yes. And when God says no, we should remember what God has done in the past. If you read the Bible, you find that God repeatedly reminds the Israelites that they ought to remember Him. They ought to remember what He's done. They ought to remember that He chose them, that He delivered them from Egypt, He brought them through the wilderness, how He brought them into the promised land, and so on and so forth. So why is it important to remember what God has done? Let's just look at Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, the psalmist begins in a state of despair. He says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and my soul refused to be comforted. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favour again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? So the psalmist stated, started in a state of despair. He says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. And at night, my soul refused to be comforted. And he told God, you kept my eyes from closing. He couldn't sleep because of the distress that he was in. So is God no longer merciful? Is God no lo longer loving? And where is God? But then the psalmist chose to remember God's past deeds and miracles. And in the next verses, he says, Then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. So you notice that the psalmist says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your miracles and I will meditate on all your works. So it is I will, it is a deliberate choice. So sometimes whether we feel it or we don't, or we don't feel like doing it, we need to do the right thing by God. And here, the psalmist chose to remember what God had done in the past, despite the present circumstances. And that remembering moved him from a place of hopelessness to a place of hope. And after the remembering, he goes on to say, Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great is our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeem the people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. So when we are in the valley, we need to choose to remember what God has done for us, how he has saved us, made us his children, how he has been there for us to thick and thin, been there all the time. And we choose to remember what God has done for people that we know of, for people we've read about, for people we've heard about. We choose to remember what God has done for the people as recorded in the Bible. And we remember that He is a God who is unchanging. His character is unchanging. So if God is unchanging, then whoever He was in the past, He will be the same for us today and for all of our tomorrows. And whatever He was for us in the past, being there for us, he will similarly be here for us today and for all of our tomorrows. And remembering restores our faith. It turns our hearts Godward and it transforms despair into praise and hope. Now, our human memories are very short. 
Even in good times, sometimes, you know, we thank God, and then you think about, what was I thanking God yesterday, two days ago, last week? We sometimes cannot remember. And especially when we are in a difficult place, it is even harder to recall what goodness God has given to us. So a friend in CMC shared with us about the keeping of a Thanksgiving journal. And with her permission, I'm sharing it with you. So what she does is every day she will think about at least three things to thank God for and she will write them down. So when she was going through a very difficult period and despite the suffering she had before her, the trials that she and her loved ones are going through, she still managed to find at least three things to thank God for. And in her words, these things did not be mountaintop experiences. They could be as simple as finding a car park lot. So when I heard that sharing, I thought I would try to do that. And when I started, I found that I couldn't stop at three. I would do this like quite late at night, and then I go beyond three, and after that I have to tell myself I need to stop because I got to go to bed. So you might want to try this because I think when you do this, it helps us to see God's goodness in every part of our lives, and it helps us recall God's goodness when we are in a dark place. Right, the next thing is to know. And when I say to know, I mean that we need to know God's character. We need to know who God is. And when God says no, and we know who He is, and we know His character, we can trust His heart even if we cannot understand His actions. There's so many things we can say about who God is, so I'll just, but I'll just highlight three. So the first one is that God is our Father. And in Matthew 7, Jesus teaches about prayer. Matthew 7, 9 to 11 says, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So many times when I try to understand the heart of our Heavenly Father, I think about I myself as a parent, how I would treat my daughters, what I would do for them, what I wouldn't do for them. So if my daughter asked me for a fish, I wouldn't give her a snake. If she asked for bread, I wouldn't give her a stone. So if I, the sinful parent, know how to love my children, how much more the God who loves us immensely more than we could ever love our children. And surely this God cannot mean us any harm. So we need to choose to trust the Father's heart. Just as I want my daughters to trust my heart and my intentions, even if they cannot understand my actions, so too God wants us to trust His heart and His, action, and His intentions, even if we cannot understand His actions. The second thing is that God is all wise. So Isaiah 55, 8 to 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God is God, and we are not. And it's something that we need to remember. How could we ever comprehend the mind of God? I, I think of an ant. And ants cannot comprehend an iota of my mind. And so too, we, mere humans, cannot comprehend the mind of God. God sees beyond what we see, and His plan and His will for us are infinitely good because God is infinitely good. Sometimes we ask and beseech God for something that we really want, and in our minds, that's really the best thing for us. But in all of our praying, we always need to leave room for God to say no because He always knows what is best. And we want to be in His will and not to be out of it. So think about the prodigal son. He thought that taking his inheritance, going out into the world was the best thing, but how wrong he was. So we really need to be in God's will than to be out of it. The third thing is that God is all loving. We know that God is sovereign. But if God is sovereign and He is neither loving nor merciful, then I think we have a lot to worry about because then we will be subject to a God 
who is not caring and will be subject to the, the actions of a God who doesn't care. But praise and thanks be to God, He does care immeasurably more than what we can understand or imagine. In the book of Lamentations, the writer grieves over the state of Jerusalem. So Jerusalem had been conquered by Babylon. It was ransacked. The temple was destroyed. The people were exiled. Whoever was left there was starving. There was starvation. There was extreme poverty. It was a state of desolation. And when the writer looked at Jerusalem, he was just overcome with a sense of loss, with very deep grief. But then the writer chose to remember who this God is, this God that he knew, the God that he believes in. And he says in Lamentations 3, 21 to 24, 24, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. So the writer chose to remember who this God is. This God he has known, this God who doesn't change, and this God who is loving, compassionate, and faithful. And he was lifted from hopelessness and despair to hope and praise. So how do we know who God is? We need to read his word, we need to meditate on his word, we need to commune with him on a daily basis, and not just only when we hit a roadblock, otherwise when we hit that roadblock, we will have no ready well of resources to dip into to recall who God is. I love this quote that someone shared with me recently. It says, a bird does not sing because it has an answer, it sings because it has a song. And that's from Maya Angelou. We may not have an answer to everything, to life's trials and predicaments, but we have Christ in us, and that is reason enough to sing. I'd like to share with you um, something that I shared with at the 8 a.m. service. So when I was preparing the sermon and, and thinking about this point about knowing God, the hymn that came to my, my mind was, I know whom I have believed. And I thought, well, that would be a good hymn to sing for 8 a.m. service, but I told nobody. I didn't tell Rupert. I didn't tell Ping Chuan, who was the worship leader this morning. And then when I got the list of hymns that Ping Chuan had chosen, she chose, I know whom I have believed. And that is not a, sing that, a, a song that we sing very often. So I was just amazed, right? Isn't God amazing that he works in the background? You know, he, he connects all of us to achieve his purpose. So all praise be to God. So we need to know who God is. We need to know his character. And only then can we trust him, even if we don't understand. So the next point is to trust, which is what I said just now. So you remember in the Bible, um, the book of Acts records Paul's missionary journeys. And in Paul's second missionary journey, it says in the Bible that Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And the book of Acts goes on to say that when Paul and his companions came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So Paul had good intentions to preach the gospel in Asia and in Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit did not allow him to. Do the people, or did the people in Asia and Bithynia need the gospel? Of course they did, but it wasn't God's plan for Paul to go there. It was God's plan for him to go to Macedonia. And so Paul went, and the gospel went to Europe first. I'm not sure Paul understood why God did that, but what he did was to submit and to obey. So when we don't understand why God does something, our duty is to submit to his will and to obey him. So one morning, not so long ago, I got up and I was feeling kind of, kind of overwhelmed by a number of challenges. And then God reminded me of a verse that I read in my, during my devotional two days before that. 
And that verse is Psalm 68, 19. It says, Praise be to the Lord, to God our Saviour, who daily bears our burdens. And when I read that verse, it was the word daily that struck me because it indicated to me that when God carries our burdens, it was an active carrying. He's actively carrying our burdens. He's actively doing that every day. And two days after I read that verse, that morning I got up feeling overwhelmed. And then the Holy Spirit brought to mind that verse that I had read, and that gave me comfort that I could just hand over my burdens every day because God was actively carrying them for me. So I bring up this point also to say that, encourage everybody that we need to read God's Word daily. We need to meditate on His Word daily and let His Word be deposited in our hearts, in our minds, so that the Holy Spirit can call to remembrance whatever has been deposited when the need arises. So I'd like to share with you an experience that I had. And through that experience, God taught me that He is always working in the background for us. Even when we are not looking for it, even when we do not know that we need it. So in December 2019, I went for my annual health check. So during the health check, the doctor did a physical examination and then she touched my face, touched my jawline and she said, I didn't feel this before, but this doctor only sees me once a year. It's not my GP. I go to Mount Alvernia Hospital every year for my health check, right? So I was thinking, you saw me one year ago and you said you didn't feel anything. But anyway, I... I actually noticed that it's not, it wasn't visible. It's just that if you touch here at the tip of the jawline, it was like the bone was protruding a little bit. So I consulted somebody. I think it was my GP and he wasn't very concerned. But the health check doctor was concerned and she said, go through an ultrasound scan straight away. So I had that done. And then they found that there was something there. So they said I had to see an ENT surgeon, an ear, nose and throat surgeon. So I had already been seeing an ENT surgeon for some years, for my years, and I went to see him, and then he found that I had a tumour in my cheek. And he said that I had to have it removed because if I didn't, it could turn cancerous. And then he showed me a photograph of someone's cheek opened up during surgery. I was absolutely horrified when I saw that because I couldn't tell what was tumour, what was nerve, what was muscle? I don't even know whether I'm using the right word, right? Muscle. And it was a mess of red. And I thought, how would the surgeon know what's the nerve and what's the tumour? What if by a slip of hand he cut my nerve, right? So I was really quite terrified and I was trying to stall for time. So that was in January 2020. So I told him, I said, in March, I'm going to the Holy Land. So if you remember, in March 2020, Pastor Edwin was supposed to bring us to the Holy Land but that was cancelled because of COVID. So I said, after the Holy Land, I'm going to the US in June because my first grandchild was going to be born. I said, after June, I've got disciple classes to, to, uh, classes to facilitate. That will take me to October. So I said, what about November? But he wasn't prepared to wait so long. July was about as long as he was prepared to wait. So I said, okay, I'll get back to you. So I went home. I decided that I had to pray to ask God to show me when, and then about two days later, when I was reading the Bible, God gave me the answer. And you know, I'm mentioning two days about that Psalm 68, I'm mentioning two days about this, but really, that is a lot of times how God speaks to me. When I need an answer from Him, I ask Him, and especially when it's something where I need to know pretty soon, God shows up, you know, and a lot of times it's through His Word. So that day, the, the, the thing that I read about was about Balaam, right? Recorded in the book of Numbers. So in the book of Numbers, chapters 22 to 24, um, the Israelites were in the wilderness, but the king of Moab was terrified of them. And so the king of Moab called Balaam the prophet to curse the Israelites. And he was going to pay Balaam to do the cursing. So Balaam tried to curse the Israelites three times, but every time he opened his mouth to curse the Israelites, 
the curse words couldn't come out because God stopped him from doing that. It was only words of blessing that came out. And so the Israelites were protected. They were saved. And so these Israelites were wandering in the desert, blissfully unaware of the danger that they were in, and totally not aware of what God was doing in the background to protect them. So when I read that, I knew that God was telling me to do something about it. Because I had this tumour that I had really no clue about. I mean, if you look at my face, you wouldn't have known. If the doctor, the health check doctor, did not touch my face, did not touch my jawline, she wouldn't have known because it wasn't visible. And I, I didn't feel anything, you know, unless you touch her, right? There was no discomfort or anything. So I realized that God had brought all these things to pass to bring that tumor to my attention, and therefore I better do something about it. So I called the surgeon, make an appointment for the surgery, and scheduled it for 3rd of February. So morning of the surgery, I was in the room waiting to be brought into the operating theater, but I had a sense of peace. I wasn't worried or nervous at all. And then they put me on the trolley and wheeled me in. And I was being wheeled into the operating theater on the trolley. I had an image of Jesus walking at the end of the trolley accompanying me in. And then when I was in the operating theater, the surgeon came in. He said, let us pray. He put his hand on me prayed for me, and then gave me the general anesthetic. And thank God, the surgery was a success. The tumour was benign. So he told me that the tumour was the size of a walnut. And I asked him, with shell or without shell? <laughs> and he said, with shell. And for a tumour that size, it would have been growing there for quite a while. So... That experience and that story in the Bible has taught me that God is always watching out for us. He is always working in the background, even if we do not see it, even if we do not know that we need something, and even if we are not looking for something. So indeed, He sees all of our lives from before we were born all the way to eternity. So let's trust in Him, even though we can't see why, because God sees the whole picture and we don't. But of course, if God's answer is a no, but it is not a final no, then we need to press in and continue to pray unceasingly. You know, like you think about health issue or something, right? And as Pastor Barnabas always tells us to pray audaciously. So let us be intentional in our responses to God. When God says yes, let us choose to thank Him let us choose to tell of his goodness and let us choose to remember that all that we have has come from him. And when God says no, let us choose to remember what he's done in the past and choose to know him, to know his character and choose to trust him. This weekend is Stewardship Weekend and just now I mentioned about God wanting us to use whatever he has given us wisely as stewards for him. And this morning, as we consider this awesome God, this God who loves us, who has been there for us all the time, through thick and thin, who has given us all things, let us think about how we ought to respond to Him. So good stewardship requires us to trust in God, amongst other things. It requires us to trust that even as we render unto Him in the way He wants us to, He will never leave us in want. So how does God want you to use whatever He's given to you? And are you willing to give of your resources with grateful hearts for His kingdom? Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you that you are the sovereign God, the God who is all-wise, who is all-knowing and all-loving, and the God who has given us all things. Father, teach us to submit to your will always, Lord, and to trust, Lord, that your will is the best for us. Teach us to, and help us, Lord, to grow in you, to walk closer with you, and to grow in the knowledge of you. And Father, help us too, Lord, to render willingly to you whatever belongs to you, and to be good stewards who please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.